your attention. I get the, the honor of making an uh, introduction. It really is a great honor for me. I uh, have no bow, so this is straight from my head. Uh, in 1998, a uh, young doctor came to endorse me on behalf of the Kentucky Taxpayers uh, Alliance. And uh, that was my first, uh, he introduced me for the office I hold now. Uh, it took me 12 years to get here, but I got a, an endorsement in 1998. Then in 2010, we saw each other a lot uh, as we was both doing a campaign that year. Uh, uh, Rand Paul was the, uh, had the endorsement of the Kentucky Tea Party, which gave him a boost in the primary. And, he won it, and then he won uh, the general election handsomely, and he became our uh, senator representing Kentucky, and has done such a wonderful job. Uh, at this time, I want to introduce to you the 45th president of the United States, <laughs> Senator Rand Paul. Devin's telling the truth, we did not write that down for him. <laughs> that came straight out of I'm not sure. Yeah. But thank you, David, for the kind introduction, and thanks for having me today. Um, I'm back in Kentucky, and I'm glad to be home. I'm home for a couple weeks, a little traveling, mostly around Kentucky, but I'll be home for Easter. And uh, we're trying to do most of our travels within about an hour of home, so I can get back home for dinner, which is nice. Uh, I've got good news and bad news from Washington. Good news is your government's open. Bad news is your government's open. All right? It's open and they didn't really listen or learn anything from closing. Um, we're still borrowing about $1.4 million every minute. If you want to be scared or afraid or worried about the future, look at the debt clock. I think it's the debtclock.org. It's spinning so fast you can't even see the numbers on the right edge. We're over $17 trillion. That's equal to our entire economy. So we did have a shutdown, and during the shutdown, they sent us all notices. And they said, um, tell us which of your employees are essential and unessential. Uh, Rachel and Jason's here, and I'm not going to go into which one is essential and which one is unessential. But the, the funny thing about it is you think, well, we've learned something from this. We got a, a notice from the EPA. And they said uh, that 95% of their people were unessential. And I said, boy, there really is something we could learn here from this. But then I learned that it's like everything else, it's fixed. It's a game in Washington. There is not, there wasn't going to be any savings. We were shut down for about two weeks. You think, well, I guess we'd save some money from not paying the people who, who didn't come to work, the unessential people. They all got paid. In fact, it costs more to shut your government down than to keep it open because they pay everybody. In fact, you want to be unessential so you don't have to go to work during a shutdown. They look forward to a shutdown. They encourage it. It's a holiday for a couple of weeks and it's paid. But they went through this shutdown and they looked through the rolls and they were looking at the EPA and they were looking at the people and they came across one guy named Jonathan Beagle. And they said, well, he's been working here 11 years. He makes over $100,000 a year. But he, he doesn't seem to be here very often. He been, hadn't been here in weeks. So they went to his supervisor and they said, well, this Jonathan Beal, every time he gets up for a promotion, he gets it. Every time he has a performance review, everybody says he's doing a great job and he keeps getting promotion after promotion. In fact, some say he was like the right-hand man to Gina McCarthy. And it's like, but he's never here. And his supervisor said, oh, that's right. He works for the CIA. He's on assignment. The EPA and the CIA? So someone did something they had never, ever done before. They actually went and asked the CIA. And they said, who? Jonathan Beale never heard of it. For 11 years, he'd been telling his boss that he worked for the CIA and he needed time off. Weeks at a time. So here's the way I imagine Jonathan Beale. It's like laying by the pool, Chase Lounge with a beer. His boss calls and says, are you coming in? No, I'm on secret assignment in Istanbul. <laughs> He got away with this for 11 years, and you'll wonder why your government, $17 trillion in the hole, they let a guy not show up for work for 11 years. To add insult to injury, do you know what his specialty is? Global warming. I mean, climate change. I'm sorry, we don't call it global warming anymore. It's now called climate change. 
So anyway, we went through this big grand shutdown, and everybody says, oh, we, you know, we couldn't possibly cut. I sent letter after letter to the president with some suggestions. One of the suggestions I had for the president was, why don't we just not rehire the people who retire from government? This isn't even laying off any federal workers. Just don't rehire the ones who retire. It's $6 billion a year. So we passed what they call the sequester in 2011. We go a year and a half. We go through the presidential election. Remember the debates? Romney and Obama, and Obama said, we will not have a sequester. And about three months later, we did get the sequester. We didn't do any planning. If you had a plan in advance for a year and a half, just not rehiring people, that's about $9 billion that could have been saved. I wrote him a letter to the effect that I'm still waiting on an answer. If anybody talks to the president, will you tell him we, we would like an answer? We also told him, why don't we have competitive bids? And you say, well, certainly government has competitive bids. Well, they kind of do and they kind of don't. They go for the lowest bid, except for that you have to put wages in your bid that have nothing to do with your community. So if you want to build a federal project in Ohio County, if it's federal money, the wages may well have something to do with Chicago wages or union wages for carpenters in Chicago. And uh, that's good for the individual carpenter, but not good for the community because your school that might cost $600,000 to build, 200,000 of that was in wages that were way above what you would normally pay in your community. And we get stuck with these, that's $10 billion a year. If you would allow competitive wages, just to open it up and say, we'll take the lowest bid, you know, for each government job. So the way the rest of the world works, why wouldn't you want your taxpayer dollars to work that way? But we get no answer back from the president. No answer, nothing changes. And you say, well, how do we get every year a trillion dollars out of balance? The interesting thing is when we vote on the budget up there, you think we're voting on the whole thing. We're only voting on a third of the budget. So two-thirds of your budget is Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. It's never voted on. It's on autopilot. That's part of the problem. It's called mandatory spending and we never vote on it. It just keeps going on, uninterrupted and uncontrolled. So the remaining third of governments, what we vote on, when we talk about a budget, we're really talking about a third of the spending. That third is half national defense and half other stuff. So immediately when we had the shutdown, we, Republicans and Democrats, one thing we finally did together is we paid the military because we didn't want to shut the military down. So now when you were, they were talking about a government shutdown, it's a half of a third. It's a sixth of the government. It's about 15, 16 percent of the government was shut down. But the president was worried that you might not notice. So he uh, said, well, we have to do something. They won't notice it. They've got to feel some pain. So he decided to wrap the World War II monument. It has no entrance. It has no exit. No one works at the world. It's beautiful. Have you ever been, anybody ever been to the World War II monument? It's beautiful. But there is no entrance and exit. No one's paid to, I mean, they probably have to mow the grass, but I think it's even up, it was built with private funds, and I think it's upkeep as private funds. The president, by golly, he wanted to make sure you knew your government was shut down, so he wrapped it with barricades. But the best image, and if you want to remember an image of the government being shut down, other than that we wasted money by paying people who weren't going to work, the other image I'd like you to remember is the World War II vet showing up cutting the barricades, throwing them on their bus, going to the White House, and throwing them on the lawn to send the president a message. I think that message that we displayed and sent to the president is the one that needs to resonate. Because ultimately, a lot of Washington is show and games. But nobody ever really seems to change anything. So the two-thirds of government, you know, if you're running a trillion-dollar deficit, two-thirds of the problem is in your entitlement programs. And you say, well, we want that. We want Social Security. We want Medicare. That's fine. We've got to figure out how to pay for it. And people say, well, whose fault is it? Is it Republicans' fault? Is it Democrats' fault? Whose fault is it that Social Security is $6 trillion in the hole? That Medicare is 35 to $40 trillion in the hole? It is neither political party's problem. If you want to blame anybody, if you want to say, whose fault is it? Blame your grandparents for having too many damn kids. We had all these kids born after World War II. It's nobody's fault, but we had the baby boomers born, and now they're retiring. It's nobody's fault. It's just demographics. Each successive generation had less kids. So the, the kids of the baby boomers had smaller families, and the kids of the baby, the grandkids of the baby boomers had smaller families. So we have less people working now. It used to be like 16 workers for one retiree, and now it's about three workers for one retiree. So it's all just math. But you can fix these problems, but nobody wants to fix them. When I first was elected, I sat across from the president in lunch with the vice president sitting next to me, 
And I got to ask a question. I said, why is this a partisan issue at all? Why don't we acknowledge that we're living longer, which is good. Why don't we acknowledge that we've got a lot of retired people and less workers. And why don't we say to my generation that you're going to have to wait a little longer. And just acknowledge that that's the way, that's the only way Social Security can be made sound again. And Medicare. Is we wait a little longer. We did it once before. Reagan and Tip O'Neill came together and gradually let the age rise. It fixes most of the problems that we have. You can do it like two or three months a year. When we did it in 1983, I think we just now got to 67 completely for everybody. It's been a couple of months a year for like 20 some odd years. You can do it again, but if you just put your head in the sand and say, I'm not going to do it, or keep your hands off my Social Security, whatever else, we're never going to get to a solution on this. And you say, well, I don't care. I don't know what a budget deficit means. I don't know what a trillion dollars is. What does it have to do with me? Well, it has to do with you. And if you want your kid to live in your basement for the next, you know, 20 years, it has to do with you and your kids. You want them to get jobs, we've got to have less deficit. <laughs> Economists say that we're losing a, um, maybe a million jobs a year by this deficit. <laughs> by the burden of this deficit of having to pay for it and what it does to the rest of the economy, that that money is taken out of productive use. And you say, well, how can we have jobs for all our kids? How can we have good manufacturing jobs in America again? How can we have good paying jobs even for people just as they get out of high school? Well, what we need is we need more money here. I always tell people, you want, you want to stimulate Kentucky's economy, leave more money in it, which means send less money to Washington. Money has to be welcome, and people have to be welcome who make money. So, for example, Right now, there's $2 trillion overseas, made with, earned by American companies. Apple's got $180 billion, Caterpillar's got a bunch, and your politicians are up there in Washington beating up Apple and Caterpillar for moving their stuff overseas instead of looking in the mirror and seeing where the problem is. The problem is Congress. The problem is the tax code. Right now, the corporate income tax in Canada is 15%. Ours is 35%. We have the highest corporate income tax in the world, and you wonder why companies move overseas. We have one of the highest personal income tax. You know, we pay higher taxes than the rest of the world. Our regulatory burden is enormous. We pay $2.8 billion in taxes, but our regulatory burden is over $2 billion. So if you're a company looking to expand, not only do you have cheaper labor, which we can't do a lot about, but, you know, the transportation costs and the skilled labor being better in our country, we would still make things in our country if it were just labor. But if you combine labor with high taxes and high regulation, all three together is, you know, you're just wishing jobs overseas, and that's what it's been doing. But see, what we had is when we had the last presidential election, you have people, President Obama on one side, Romney on the other, but the President Obama just telling you, you got to get more taxes from rich people and rich companies. Well, that's who you work for. So, I mean, if you want that, you want to feel good, oh, I beat up and I got some more money out of rich people and I raise their taxes, fine, but don't complain then when you're 26 or 28 or 30-year-old kids still in your basement can't find a job. We are all interconnected. I don't have a Mercedes. I got four beat-up cars and four tuitions and everything else, but I don't mind if you do. One of my kids may work for the Mercedes dealers. One of my kids may sell you a Mercedes. It isn't about who you are or what you have. It's about jobs and getting more jobs, but if we, if we dislike our neighbor because they've got three cars, we're never going to be rich again as a country. We've got to figure out that great wealth can come. When Reagan cut the rates in 1980, the top rate was 70% for rich people. He cut it to 50, but we didn't sort of have this debate back then that we're having now. Nobody was like saying, oh, that's just going to help rich people. He cut the rates from 70 for rich people to 50. Then he cut them from 50 to 28. You know what happened? 20 million jobs were created. There was a boom from the mid-80s all the way through to 2000, and some people argue, and I accept that argument, that it had to do with lowering taxes. One of the things that I've been trying to do is promote how we would help people who are having trouble, though. Republicans get accused of, like, you don't care about the unemployed, you don't care about people down on their luck. Well, I went to Detroit this year, and I took a program that will help Detroit, but it'll also help Eastern Kentucky. It'll also help Western Louisville. This program is called Economic Freedom Zones. And what we do is we go into an area of high unemployment, one and a half times the national average, and we dramatically lower the taxes for 10 years. We take the corporate income tax all the way down to 
We also take the personal income tax all the way down to 5%. Since some people don't pay any income tax, we lower their payroll tax. Both the employer and the employee lower their payroll tax. We get rid of the capital gains tax. We invite people with money to come in from other countries. If you want to move to Detroit from China and you've got $50,000, come on. We lower the rates of how much money you have to bring in. To bring in money and capital and people who, who want to start and create jobs. The Democrats have nothing to offer for Detroit. There is no offer. They say, oh, we'll give them some more money. Where are you going to get it? We're a trillion dollars short. My plan is we give them back their own money. We don't give them your money. We don't even send your money to Eastern Kentucky. We've been doing that for 40 years, and that doesn't work. Leave the money where it's being earned. Why is this better than a government stimulus or a government handout? If I come to Ohio County and say, well, I've collected $100,000 from you, and I'm going to give it back to you, but I'm going to give it to Mrs. Jones, and she's going to start a business and hire 10 people in town. I'll probably pick the wrong person nine times out of ten. I don't know who's going to be good in business. The only way you determine who's good in business in your community is you all vote. Where do you go to eat? Where do you buy your groceries? Where do you buy your stuff? You're voting every day on who deserves to have your money by who gives you the best service and product. If I give you a tax reduction, though, in Ohio County, instead of me bringing the $100,000 check back and giving it to one person say, create jobs, what if I give you $100,000 back in the form of reducing your taxes? Where does it go? More of it will go to the richer people in town. More of it will go to the people who own businesses. But that's where your jobs are created, and they're the ones paying the taxes. So we reduce those taxes. But it's not me choosing that. You've already chosen who's wealthy in your community by buying their stuff. It's all voluntary. People become wealthy by selling you good things, providing good service. But we need to think about this in another way. If we're going to figure out how to move forward as a country, we've got to give up on sort of this us versus them, rich versus poor, owners versus non-owners. We have to figure out that we're all connected in this, and then we can move forward. I'm optimistic that that can occur. I'm optimistic that we have the greatest country in the world founded on the greatest documents. When we believe in those documents again, when we move forward and say, you know what, it's time to grow, we will in an explosive way, but we, we need new leadership. So I hope you'll be part of that. Thank you for letting me come. Couple questions, uh, as long as we have questions. Oh, oh, what about our defense? We're hearing a lot about it, and the American didn't even consider it because we get a lot of information on cutting our defense like they did before. It sounds like hurt us. But I think in order to have a strong national defense, we have to have a sound budget. So it is important, and they are interconnected. Um, Admiral Mullen said about a year or two ago, he said that the biggest threat to our national security right now is our debt. So we do have to be worried that you can't, you can't be a strong country unless you have sound, you know, the reason we beat the Soviet Union, I always say, wasn't in a pitched battle. We beat them because the engine of capitalism beat the engine of socialism. Some of that was spending. We spent, we had a, a robust military. Reagan believed in peace through strength. I think all of that is important. Um, and while I am for a strong national military, I'm also not though for a blank check. So we do have to be careful how we spend it and not think that just because it's in the military we're not going to be very careful that it's not wasted. So occasionally you'll hear reports of $500 hammers or $2,000 toilet seats or whatever. So even in government, no matter where it is, even for a good purpose like national defense, we have to keep a close watch on it. One of the ways that I've proposed that we find more money for what we actually need is to audit the Pentagon. We've never had an audit. In fact, they say they're too big to be audited, which I think is kind of a problem when the government says they're too big to be audited. That being said, I think the number one priority of what your tax dollars should go to is national defense. That's something we can't do privately. It's something the federal government needs to be doing. But it's also why, if there's a question, can something be done privately or publicly, we should try to keep the government out of most other things that it can't, it doesn't need to be involved in, so you have more money left over for these things. We have a government for the last 70 to 80 years that has grown and gotten involved in everybody's lives in a million different ways. And uh, you can't turn around without seeing a new tax or a new regulation on what you do. So uh, yes, we need a strong national defense, but we have to figure it out in context of also having a, a balanced budget. Um, 
One of the things you hear about a lot is gridlock. Can you tell us anything that you have done to help chip away at that? Yeah. One thing I'm working on right now, and it's still a long shot, but you know how I told you there's $2 trillion overseas in profit, American companies, and it's not coming home because we tax it at 35%. I'm in discussions with several Democrats in the Senate to try to pass a law to let it come home at 5% and take that money and put it into infrastructure, roads, bridges, dredging, and so we'd have more funds. Right now, one of the reasons why there's a shortage of money for roads is the gas tax brings in about $30 billion we spend about 40 billion. So like everything else, it's out of balance. This would correct that imbalance. I'd like to do it forever. We did it one time in 2005 and it brought in about 20 to 30 billion dollars in tax revenue. So this is a great example of you can lower a tax rate and it actually brings in more revenue. Right now, zero is coming in. In fact, this is, this is what annoys me about people beating up on Apple. Apple's just doing what they're supposed to. They have, they have shareholders. Probably somebody in here has a retirement fund that may own some Apple, st Apple shares. It's their job to maximize profit. They actually borrowed money last year rather than bring any home. So they have $180 billion. They borrowed money at 2% and then paid their dividends out of that rather than bring any home. I want them to bring that money home. They're American companies. They earned it overseas, and they're doing it legally, but I'd still like them to see them bring them home. That is something we have a chance to work on. Um, I'll give you one other. There are a lot of examples where I've worked with the other side. One I would say was on civil liberties in the NSA, trying to say that uh, the government shouldn't be looking at your phone calls, your phone records, your text messages, your computer, unless they have suspicion and have a warrant with your name on it. If they think you're a terrorist, I'm fine with them looking at your stuff, but they have to have your name on it. And they have to call a judge, just like they would if they thought you were a rapist or a murderer. I've worked with Democrats on that. And then one final thing I would say that we've worked together on is about a year ago, Barbara Boxer and Dianne Feinstein put together a bill on pipeline regulation. And you say, oh, well, Republicans don't believe in any regulation. Well, that's not exactly true. I looked at the, at the bill. They were going to pass it on a Friday with no vote. And it was, the bill was initiated because of an explosion, San Bruno. Eight people died in a big pipeline explosion in a neighborhood there near San Francisco. And I said, well, let's look and see if we're fixing the problem. Turned out, the bill they were going to pass in a hurry, which actually industry liked, wasn't going to do anything for the old pipes. The ones that were breaking are the 50-year-old pipes, welds or whatever, and there's no, they uh, weren't going to do any testing on those. They were grandfathered in. In that case, I did work with them, got them to change the bill, get rid of the grandfather clause, and if you are going to look at pipelines, really the ones that need looking at more than any are the old ones, not the new ones, and so we got them to look at the old pipelines. That was another area where we worked uh, together with Democrats on. Yes. This is a big issue, and we've talked not only about consumers, but we've also talked to pharmacists, independent pharmacists, about this. And it's something that we're trying to find a fix for. But um, like a lot of things that come out of Washington, when you do a one-size-fits-all package, Obamacare, this is the kind of stuff that gets stuck in there. They think of, see it as a cost savings, but they don't understand all the businesses they may put out of business, or the people who live in a fairly rural community and have to drive 20 or 30 miles to go get uh, prescriptions filled. So it's something we're very aware of, and one of the things that we've talked about to try to correct, this, not particularly this problem, but the whole idea that independent pharmacists are at a disadvantage to these really big chain pharmacies, is I would let independent pharmacists organize, like in a trade association, 10,000 independent pharmacies to have one negotiating person, it's so the same thing that could happen with retailers. Let's say I own two convenience stores and I have no leverage with Visa. Right now it's illegal for me to collude with other people who own convenience stores. It's part of antitrust, but it's stupid because I'm actually the little guy, or as a physician, we, we're not allowed, if I get together with four other physicians and try to negotiate with the insurance company, they'll tell me that's illegal and that's antitrust. But the physician's actually the little guy or woman compared to the insurance company, which is really big, so it's, Antitrust has been sort of turned on its head. There are several things we need to look into this, but part of the problem is letting government have too much control in the first place. Maybe one more? 
Yes. You're uh, tapping into the aspirations of libertarians and young people, minorities, and also people who feel their beloved country is on the wrong track. I was wondering if you would just go ahead and expedite the process and uh, announce your candidate. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get me in trouble. So. You have been thinking about it, you know, and I've talked with my family about it, and I think it's too early to make a final decision on it. And I do think that, you know, from a partisan, I know this isn't supposed to be a real partisan speech, but from a partisan point of view, I think the Republican Party needs to be bigger somehow. And to me, that does mean reaching out to people from all different walks of life, all different ethnic groups, and trying to say that there is a place for you in the Republican Party. And so I have been trying to do that. You know, I'll be, um, I was at Howard University last year, I'm going to be at the Urban League in Cincinnati this year, trying to take a message that says, you know what, the Republican Party is the party that is offering solutions. It's not that one party cares more than the other. The decision on voting ought to be which policy has worked and which one may work. And uh, so, for example, education. Nobody here is against education, right? But we might have different views on how we make it better. And I think in some of the big cities, education is failing. Um, and then some of our problems are more complicated. We have to acknowledge there's not really anything government can do, but it doesn't mean we should not acknowledge it's a problem. The number one probably factor uh, linked or related to, to um, poverty in our country is having kids before you're married. Government can't do anything about that, but everybody in the community needs to know it's a problem and we need to try to change the next generation. Doesn't mean we blame the person now who uh, maybe has kids and didn't ever get married, but we need to try to encourage the next generation not to. And that family unit, that family structure is incredible. I mean, people sort of discount that. Families have been around for thousands and thousands of years, the family unit, it's an important thing. But, you know, I'm not, a, I can't change you, I can't make you different, but everybody needs to acknowledge that it's a big, it's, it's hard to get ahead if you have one or two or, you know, four kids and you aren't married, it's just really hard to get ahead. So, uh, but we need to look at all of those things honestly and see where we move forward as a country. Thanks for having me. Paul, thank you. We know you've got a busy schedule, and we appreciate you coming and speaking with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, one final announcement, and I'll just remind you that uh, May 20th is our next meeting. Um, we will listen from, we'll hear from state government uh, on, in May, on May 20th. We've got uh, Tommy Thompson and Jerry Rhodes joining us and speaking on the date. So have a good day. Thank you.